I want to welcome all of you Academy members who've joined us today for this webinar. We're going to discuss data breach risk scanning. How can we know in a healthcare environment what unprotected data exists on our network? We all have obligations under HIPAA to protect privacy of patient information. So one of the most difficult things is actually seeing where that data is stored. We know where we think it is. So my name is Ray Cool. I'm president of PBSI Technology Solutions, we're honored to be a partner with the Academy. For many years, we've provided services for the Academy itself, as well as for many, many members. Thank you for joining today, Academy members. So we're going to be brief. The topics are going to be simple. Data theft, what are the current facts we know about availability of data? We're going to look at a couple of different tests. One is a dark web exposed password check. That will be, if you're like me, will be frightening. And we're going to look at what a data breach risk scan is and how that works and how it finds data and what can I do to protect the data once I identify that it's there. So thanks for joining. Some of you, this is your first exposure to PBSI. Many of you, this is the result of a long-term relationship where we're providing technical services for you. And I want to thank you very much for your longstanding support and that of the Academy. For those who don't know us, we provide IT, technical, and security services for many, many healthcare organizations throughout greater Cincinnati and in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And longstanding reputation has a lot to do with having lots of great people on our staff. Among our staff, 27 of them have been with us for 10 or more years. So today, our main focus is in IT security, and that's what we're going to discuss further. So a very brief review, what are the components of multilayered security? having exterior security placed at the firewall and interior security placed within our network with wireless and packet inspection, intrusion prevention. Uh, employee education, a key component. Desktop endpoint security, where we have our antivirus and patch management going on. Those are all prevention measures. Then a really important component is online monitoring, where we identify what's really happening on the network real time. A component of that our topic for today is data breach risk intelligence. So that's where we're going to focus. And um, everything else we're going to skim over today. So data theft. Those of you who are attending this webinar, you're the, quote, smart ones. You're the ones who understand that the Internet's a dangerous place. And particularly in healthcare, hackers have learned to dollarize stolen data. Key logging and phishing attacks just don't stop. They get more and more clever, more and more frequent. What we've learned, and this is part of the frightening information, is that there are millions of email passwords, email addresses and passwords for sale on the internet, and they're very, very inexpensive. So uh, we're going to actually show you an example of how passwords can be exposed, and we're going to use PBSI as the victim. So typically, if you have a keylogger installed on your PC, you're not notified. You don't get a ransomware notice saying, hey, I'm capturing your passwords, I'm capturing your passwords. But in fact, once passwords are captured, they are for sale. So I'm going to click on this link right now, and I'm going to go to a secure site that PBSI has signed up for as a security company that um, identifies lots of information. So this first information I'm linking to a story on the Hacker News. It's a website dedicated to white hats, and it identifies that there are millions, this is one example, a million decrypted Gmail and Yahoo passwords are available. So, and the pricing for each, for $10, you can buy 100,000 Yahoo accounts, and for $28, you can buy 500,000 Gmail accounts. So this is uh, unbelievable information, but very, very true. So. Data theft is a growing problem. Passwords are for sale. I'm going to now demonstrate a password exposure check. So this is the tool I just mentioned. I'm going to go to the secure site. And when that site displays, I need to enter in my two-factor authentication. which it'll do here in a moment. So now I'm using my two-factor authentication app to log in, and you'll see why, when you see this, why this requires two-factor authentication. 
which by the way, if you don't have two-factor authentication set up on all of your devices for financial logins at least, please do so. And you're going to see why. So what I'm going to do now is a search that consumers and businesses and healthcare practices can't do this kind of a search. This tool was created uh, by a security company and PVSI pays a monthly fee for access to this and we also pay per download. So I'm going to do a test now looking at PBSI's actual domain. And what it's going to do is it's going to go out and find all emails of PBSI employees who've been exposed and put on sale on the internet over the last year. So it's dating back to last June, going forward in date sequence, the most recent of which was this April, these are the passwords that were exposed. So here's the password and this in fact is the login. So my name's on here and that was in fact my normal login. When I saw this I thought, holy moly, that is unbelievable. So how did I get exposed? And the answer is you can't really find out. You don't know when. It might have been 10 years ago. What we do know is that the date of publishing for sale, April 24th in this case, is not the date that the data was acquired. This person hasn't been a PBSI employee for eight or 10 years. So the data has been owned by somebody out there and available to use for many, many years and then was just put out for sale on April of this year. And the same is true with all of these. So you'll see that some of these passwords are, these are actually the passwords that these people used. Some of these are encrypted. So I could copy this and paste it and copy this and paste and we can go to a decryption site and about half the time, we can get open passwords for even these encrypted passwords. So you can see that the source is ID theft forum, some location where things are for sale. This one came from a web page. These came from social media. Here was a key logging. This was a data breach, it says. So we don't really know. Uh, there's no way to learn exactly what happened or when it happened, but what we can learn is here are the exposed passwords and every employee who has a password out there we can identify these for your, your organizations very easily, so just contact us. We're happy to do a very inexpensive uh, queries to get your exposed passwords um, and present them to you so you can inform your staff. So that's one thing is it's a wake-up call for all of us that what we hear about, what we read about, these password hacking and login um, key logging tools that are out there, they have been in use for a long time and data in fact is available and for sale. So sorry if that really frightens you, but that is exactly my purpose and uh, we need to be aware. So we can help you mitigate. So here's a set of information. So what do you do about passwords that have been exposed? And in fact, this really applies to all of us. It doesn't matter if our password's been exposed because the fact is it may or may not have been. So what does this tell us? Change your passwords. Today would be great. If you have a quote normal password, change them. If you don't, don't use normal passwords. So this is a complex problem for all of us. How do we set up passwords for all the different things that we can log into where we can remember them and keep them safe? So I'll give you a bit of information, but what you can't do safely is to reuse and reuse passwords. So one principle that should be a part of all of our policies and procedures is do not use work, reuse work passwords on personal sites. So if I have a password or passwords that I use for logging into our EHR or our domain in our uh, medical office, don't use those same passwords personally because in both directions that can present uh, safety issues. And wherever you store credit card information, that would include Amazon.com, that would include Target.com, use a different password because once you have an email address and password, uh, folks can attempt to use that password on lots and lots of different sites. So the solution that we recommend to most folks, what I do, is use a password manager. So I use a product called Dashlane. It's $39 a year. It includes VPN security, it includes encryption for stored passwords, and it includes uh, automatic login to any website where uh, I've stored a password previously. And it's compatible across devices. So I have this same product on my iPhone, my iPad, my PC, my Microsoft Surface, my Mac, and so forth. So uh, synchronizing across all devices, $39 a year. Why? The list goes on and on of companies where email addresses have been hacked. Adobe, DocuSign, LinkedIn, Tumblr, MySpace, Yahoo, Target. I mean, this is a very, very long list. And many, many healthcare organizations uh, 
where data has been released, and you simply can't depend on your information being secure. So we have more information on this topic in other webinars we're doing, and if you'd like links to some of the other webinars we're doing for the Academy, feel free to ask. So um, another recommendation for password security is to enable two-factor authentication. So you saw it require me, when I logged in, a message to my iPhone using an authentication app that uh, I entered in. And, and it's a very safe way and uh, pretty much the only completely safe way to log into a site where you know that you and only you are, have access. And it's really not that much of a hassle. Uh, another really important thing, don't use public Wi-Fi for any site that requires a login. So if it's Amazon and you need to log into it, don't use public Wi-Fi. And beware of fake public Wi-Fi like Google Starbucks. There's no such network, but if you're in a Starbucks, you might see something that looks like that. Don't use it. Trump Wi-Fi scanned 1,000 attendees at the Republican National Convention last year because they thought, that's, a, that's certainly safe. Um, so one of the things that is important about a product like Dashlane is that you can log into Dashlane on public Wi-Fi and feel free to use, log into whatever sites you want to because you're no longer protected by the public Wi-Fi. You're protected by Dashlane inside of the public Wi-Fi. So if you want help to know if your passwords have been compromised, we can provide this information for you, whether it's for a domain or for a set of individual email addresses we have access to the data, and fortunately, it's very, very secure and not available to the public. You wouldn't want this information available on a site that you could access directly. So those are some guidelines. Now, I'm going to talk about main topic today, data breach risk intelligence. So how can we find out what data exists not out there on the Internet, on the bad web, but on our own network? So this is a component of a security set. You want your network monitored. You want to be able to have online backup with ransomware prevention in place. You want to be training your staff. But in this case, the thing I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to do that right now, is I'm going to go to PBSI's security monitoring dashboard and show you how this data breach intelligence works. So in other webinars, we've covered what is online monitoring. That's what you're seeing in front of you. This is the dashboard at PBSI that our technicians are looking at all day long and, and Alerts are posted to this automatically 24 by 7, 365. The way this works is on each PC or server on a network, very inexpensive to do this, you can install, we would install a monitoring agent which publishes either every 15 minutes or every one hour a set of information about each device. So in this case, the way this dashboard is organized, on the left-hand side you see a list of clients. So all these medical practices and the Academy of Medicine is a client of PBSI. Um, in this case, I've selected only PBSI. So once we do this, over here on the right-hand side, we only see devices that are being monitored for that organization. So I'm not making public organ uh, devices from any client. So once we've selected the client, on the right-hand side, we see the list of devices being monitored. So we can monitor servers, workstations, mobile devices, uh, services running on the network, or various network components like switches and routers and firewalls. So in this case, we're looking at servers, and I can scroll up and down the list of servers at, PC, at PBSI. When I pick on a particular server in what I'm going to call the north panel, the information being published about that displays in the south panel. So here in the south panel, these are the things it's monitoring bandwidth of the firewall that's connected. It's monitoring critical events, disk space, performance, physical disk health. It's monitoring the uh, viability and current state of both security and use of uh, UPSs that are on the network, uh, switches where it's monitoring security information, like a port lock would be actually an indication of a security issue. If there's one of the PCs connected to that switch that is currently a victim of ransomware or malware, it would likely be issuing a lot of commands. And if there's a lot of unusual activity on a port, it locks it and provides an alert message. So this is actually not just a quality of IT. This is um, a security item. So, and so forth. We're monitoring all kinds of things, uh, failed login attempts, a lot of things that would be security aware. But the one thing I want to pay attention to right now is the data risk scanning. So I'm going to go to workstations. And again, these are all workstations at PBSI. And I'm going to use my own personal workstation as a demonstration example. So I'm going to look for all workstations 
that have the name Ray in them. And so here is Ray's desktop PC. So this PC that I've selected in the north panel is actually the PC I'm sitting in front of as I'm speaking to you. So I, on the dashboard, if I'm a technician, which I'm not, if a technician can see things about Ray's PC that Ray can't see sitting in his PC. So all these things about is antivirus running successfully, um, any task scheduler issues, any events that should be investigated, any missing vulnerabilities that should be looked at. So these are things that a technician can see. And some of these are important. They'll create an alert, and some are not. They're looking generally for green, yellow, red. So there's nothing that's not, that everything's green here. That's fine. My PC seems fine. And this icon up at the top tells me that, in general, this PC is fine. There's nothing that needs attention. So there's a really good protocol for knowing when it's important to drill into something. But on Ray's PC, one of the things that's running is a task, a nightly task, we have a security scan running. So this is the topic of today. What does this security scan do? We set it up, and on any and every PC on the network, this can be done one time, or it can be done on an ongoing basis. It goes out to every device, and it scans. And one of the things it's scanning for is data that is unencrypted that has protected information. That would be social security numbers, credit card numbers, uh, dates of birth, anything that might indicate there's health information. And when I go here as a technician, I can drill into this dashboard. Sorry, I didn't want to go to the main dashboard. I can drill into my particular PC. I can drill into the, all PCs. But in this case, I'm looking for my particular PC. And it shows the results of the scan that was done most recently. So in my case, it was last night. And you can see it's looking on this secure dashboard. And it's filling it in with current data. And, and it will display back and say there's what it believes to be $1,407 worth of potential liability on this PC. And that is made up of some social security numbers and some dates of birth. So it's not unusual when we run scan to find some PCs on a network where there's $249,000 or $715,000 worth of data. So how does it know what the value of the data is? There's an algorithm it uses on the dark web, the value of a unit is commonly identified. So I don't know what the costs are and prices are, but the basic idea, if you have a name with nothing else associated, it's not worth, worth anything. But add a social security number to the name, now it's worth something. Add a date of birth, it's worth more. Add a credit card number, it's worth more, and a CCV and so forth. So each piece of data, depending on what's combined with, when you have diagnosis codes, the value of the data starts really going up. So on my PC, the scan says there were 1,407. So when this scan was run last night, it scanned all PCs and all servers at PBSI. And it created an alert system that said, hey, there are some, there's some new data that showed up on Ray's PC. Uh, now I'm going to go down and find out what is the data that was found on Ray's PC. So it says there are two files. And again, I'm playing the role of a technician here. The first one says it's on Ray's PC in his documents directory, and it's a file called sample file with dummy SS numbers. Well, in fact, that file exists on my C drive. And there are the social security numbers. Now, these aren't real. You can see ending with 544 and so forth. These are fictitious numbers that I put out there. So this scan would find them. And sure enough, the scan found this data. And if there were uh, 2,000 social security numbers, sure enough, it would show 2,000 of these. It doesn't re-expose the data. So I can't see the, the full social security number, but I can I am exposed to the fact that the scanning tool found what it believes to be social security numbers. And so now my role as a PBSI technician is to go and make a decision what to do with that document. Do I encrypt it or do I remove it? So the second file it finds, I have here also for demonstration. This one is not located on my PC. It's located on my OneDrive. So this isn't even locally stored. And it's in a folder that I call Ray Home Docs. And this, in fact, does include two dates of birth, and it's in a PDF file. So we're not reading just text files in Word or Excel. We're reading through images as well. I shouldn't say we, the scan tool. It's a patented scan tool, and the thing is it's really inexpensive to have this run. So uh, anyone listening, you can have this scan run on your network uh, one time, a very small amount of money, well worth it, something that would take you couldn't do it in hours and hours. It would take days and days on a network of any size for things to be found. So where else will it look? It will look in recycle bins. It will look in Outlook or Gmail 
uh, mail attachments. It will look at content of email. It will look at all documents that it finds. Uh, it finds in archived Outlook files. Uh, so it might be a year old, but if there was an attachment in an outgoing email that was sent unencrypted, this scan will find it. So we go and we actually clean up and remove attachments. So there's some work involved once this is found. And either we can do the work for you or we can identify here or the location of all the files that need attention and you can go do it yourself. So this is the scanning tool that um, presents information. And what you can see here is that we have, there's a PC out there with $7 million worth of data and $1.3 million worth of data. And so I'm not going to delve into this, but that's what happens is when we first run a scan for a client, uh, we typically find a lot of information that needs to be addressed, and uh, they're all very thankful. So that is data breach risk intelligence. So I wanted to demonstrate that. And um, so the way it works is there's a proactive scan done, which can include HIPAA information, PCI compliance information, um, and it, uh, that scan can be done once or it can be done monthly or it can be done daily. It's up to you. So what does it cost to do a scan? Typical network, a scan is going to be one-time scan, produce all the data for you to know where your unprotected data is, uh, likely no more than $1,500, likely less than $1,000. To have PBSI do the work to remove the data or protect it will vary, again, based on the practice and size. If you want this done ongoing, $3 per month per device. So you could have a 50-user network for $150 a month or a 10-user network for $30 a month. And then if you want PBSI to be doing ongoing remediation every time something comes up, we can do that. Or we can turn that over to you and simply make you aware of where that data is. And Academy members receive discounts on all PBSI services. So the purpose today is to inform. It's not to sell products or services. Hopefully you have seen the value. We're almost finished in the information to know that there is a tool that can help you find what for most practices is the most difficult thing, and that is where actually is the data that needs to be protected. So I can tell you that for a HIPAA, HIPAA auditor, having done this kind of work, you're way ahead of the crowd because most organizations just don't have the tools to know how to answer the question, where do we have a PHI on our network? So we're finished with content. I want to thank you very much for your membership in the Academy and your for particip participation in today's webinar.